thank you very much. Um, uh, next up, uh, but I will note the number of the people that are in the agencies doing their jobs uh, or have done their jobs, including um, um, the former head of the antitrust division, Macon Delrahim, under President Trump, believe that we need to make some changes to the laws so they can actually do their jobs to enforce the laws. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Alford. Uh, thank you, Chairman Klobuchar, Ranking Member Lee, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me for the opportunity to be here. Uh, you have my written testimony, so I'm just going to raise a few key points in my opening remarks, and hopefully we can go into more detail in the Q&A. I was going to begin by talking about the con consumer welfare standard, but my position is very similar to what Senator Lee said, so I will skip my comments with respect to the consumer welfare standard, and let me begin by discussing innovation and quality fixing. Harm to innovation raises the issue of powerful market actors engaging in what may be called quality fixing. Why do we focus so much of our attention on price fixing, but we almost never discuss quality fixing? Why are we not more concerned about big tech companies working through trade associations to collude on quality, such as a diluted common privacy standard? Why have there been no subpoenas from Congress or government enforcers investigating collusion on quality. Rare are the cases, such as the European Commission and its $1 billion fine against five European automakers for colluding with one another to delay introducing clean energy innovations. Second, antitrust law should be more particular about innovation involving startups. We should embrace the fact that a common exit strategy for startups is to be acquired. But at the same time, we should recognize that VC money is often unavailable to a startup that tries to compete with a dominant firm. And if it does try to compete, that dominant firm may seek to acquire it to eliminate a competitor. The DOJ's challenge of Visa's attempt to acquire Plaid is one recent example. And so too is the FTC's complaint against Facebook regarding the Instagram and WhatsApp acquisitions. Third, innovation is of particular concern in the context of mergers and sometimes requires innovation divestitures. To address innovation concerns in the Bear Monsanto merger, for example, the DOJ required the merging parties to divest, divest certain intellectual property and research capabilities, including pipeline R&D projects. This structural remedy was necessary to maintain competition in emerging product lines. Fourth, sometimes incumbents seek to forestall innovation to keep prices high and to reduce output. The real estate market is a quintessential example. It is dominated by the National Association of Realtors, which imposes mandatory rules that keep prices high and reduces innovation. As a result of NARS rules that require a seller to pay a buyer broker's commissions, brokerage fees for the sale of an average home in the United States are between $20,000 and $24,000, compared to $14,000 for the same priced home in other developed countries. Imagine the impact on the average American if they could purchase homes more efficiently, enhance their job mobility, and build home equity easier and earlier. Online listing services such as Zillow have offered some innovation in searching for homes, uh, and discount brokers such as Redfin and Rex offer technological solutions. None of these innovations allow consumers to buy and sell homes with the kind of transparency, functionality, and efficiency commonplace in other online marketplaces. There is nothing like Robinhood or E-Trade in the real estate market. This is all because of NAR's mandatory rules that forestall innovation. Finally, let me briefly discuss exclusionary innovation. Innovation is not always good. Sometimes innovation excludes competition. With respect to online platforms, search algorithms often are designed to self-preference. Technologies often are not interoperable. Data portability raises similar concerns. Big tech frequently introduces, quote, innovations to degrade the quality of competing products and services. Let me offer a concrete example uh, from the Texas v. Google complaint. Google uses its power in the online digital advertising marketplace to force publishers to use Google's exchange, which charges extremely high transaction fees. These fees hurt publishers' revenue, so publishers develop some code to allow them to reduce fees and route their inventory to multiple exchanges. Google was upset by this. They called it an existential threat. So they introduced a series of innovations to make it slower and harder 
for publishers to use competing exchanges. In short, Google introduced numerous innovations for the express purpose and result of excluding competition. Let me close by saying that one certainly has the impression that there is a growing bipartisan consensus that big tech companies have abused their market power in excluding innovation and that something must be done about it. That is reflected in various lawsuits filed and prosecuted by the Trump and Biden administrations, as well as almost every state attorney general. It is also reflected in the various bipartisan legislation that has been introduced in the Senate and in the House. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Very good. Well, thank you, all of you. I think I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Mijakovsky, um, because I, just, I was struck by your testimony about uh, how innovative developers like yourself, you can come up with a product, you can get it to market, you start a new business, uh, bright and shiny, and then you always come up against some kind of a wall. Um, could you talk about what your experience has been interacting with dominant platforms in more depth, like Apple, Google, and Facebook? Um, and one of the things I was thinking about, which maybe you can comment on, when you talked about how when you do emails, you can, you know, you don't know that you're dealing with a different company or whatever it is. And then I was thinking about how the when you do chats, it comes up in different colors. And it would be like with emails, you had 10 different colors and they would come up in different ways. Whereas Apple has to point out like it's not their uh, phone you're dealing with. And that often some of these are harder to read for non iPhone users. And I was just thinking how ridiculous that is compared to email or other forms of telephones, for instance, or cell phones. You don't have like a buzz in the background when you try to call someone from a different cell phone company um, or a little bing goes on. You're not on our network, sorry, good luck. Um, could, you, could you talk about this? Thanks for the question, Senator. Um, I'll answer the, the last one first and then move to the first one. Um, I think what you're referring to is the iMessage green bubble versus blue bubble situation. Uh, you probably have experienced when you're sending a message from an iPhone to an Android user, it shows up as a green bubble. Um, yeah, this is, this is a real thing. Uh, while I was doing research for this, I actually found that the uh, color differentiation between the text on a green bubble actually fails Apple's accessibility standards, which means that it's technically harder to read uh, a message to someone who has an Android phone than uh, an iPhone. And these little things add up to make it more difficult to communicate. Um, you may recall 20 years ago when uh, cell carriers used to limit, or, uh, limit SMS or text messaging between carriers. So for example, if you had an AT&T phone, you couldn't send a text message to someone who had Verizon. That's kind of the world that we're living in today. And it feels a little bit weird to be in 2021 and still have these barriers between us as we communicate. Um, regarding your question about the, uh, the walls that have been thrown up, uh, my first company, uh, Pebble, we made smartwatches. We were building a product that competed squarely with Apple's uh, Apple Watch. Um, on Android, we were able to get access to the system features that we needed to deliver a good user experience. But on Apple products, we simply weren't able to get the same level of access that products like the Apple Watch enjoyed. Um, this made it really hard to compete. Uh, and since Apple controls both the App Store as well as the operating system, um, yeah, it was hard to build an accessory that worked with uh, mm -hmm. iPhone. Mm -hmm. And could you talk a little bit, and maybe Ms. Moss, um, Mr. Harmon, you can join in on how that bill, the bill that um, Sarah Grassley and I uh, have introduced, which see Senator Hawley here and uh, is supporting it as well as Senator Durbin, um, how that would help with some of this conduct because you can't you know, put your stuff above everyone else's. You can't rip off other products and then put, uh, put it up against the product you've ripped off um, and that you can't use data and other things. That any of you can comment on it, but the difference that it would make. Ms. Moss. Thank you, and I'm happy to respond to that question. Um, I think competition in this country has risen to the level of a public policy problem, and innovation competition is a big part of that, obviously. Uh, that means I think we need uh, to use all of the tools in the public policy toolkit um, to address the, the concern of over waning competition through discriminatory conduct or other, other harmful types of behaviors. 
Um, I would say that um, using multiple tools in the toolkit, strengthening antitrust regulation is a really important way to um, remove incentives to engage in discriminatory conduct or put constraints on it. That will absolutely level the playing field for smaller rivals, innovative disruptors operating on platforms in terms of operability, in terms of access, in terms of uh, the ability to reach consumers with their products and services. I, I would say one more thing very, very briefly. Um, the tech sector moves very, very quickly, extremely quickly. And um, we are, the big five are on the downside of an acquisition cycle. We are now studying at the American Antitrust Institute the companies that are what we call up and comers. These are companies who are acquiring cloud infrastructure, they are building out and fortifying platforms. And I worry about this next gen of up and coming digital techs that are going to be um, the, 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 the powerful platforms in three to five years. So I think we want to think broadly about. Um, uh, public policy initiatives and legislative reforms like, like the, the anti-discrimination bill uh, so that we are throwing our umbrella over all of the potential firms who could grow to be dominant platforms and who would engage in uh, discriminatory conduct. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anything you want to add and then I'll turn it over to Senator Lee. Mr. Herman. Y yes. Um, I, I think the question you're asking about how would your bill specifically uh, make it easier. I think it, if you are in the situ situation of a startup, as as Pebble was, and and you look at you look at how Pebble was treated, in a situation in which uh, Apple would have to make their operate their uh, their platform available for you to plug into, or would not be able to preference their product above yours, it's going to change your calculus in terms of how you approach developing a potential competitor. Mm 